Hello, cinephiles. Tyler here. The next film you voted for is Patty Chevsky and Sidney Lumet's 1976 diatribe of the television industry, Network. I often wonder how much of Network's biting satire is lost on someone my age simply because it had all mostly come true before I had seen it. I must say, it took a couple of viewings for me to realize just how funny the movie was. You can blow the Seminole prisoner class infrastructure out your ass! I'm not knocking down my goddamn distribution charges! What I want to look at today is how the film got such great performances out of its cast. The cast won a multitude of awards including the Oscar for Best Actress won by Faye Dunaway, and the Oscar for Best Actor won by Peter Finch, who won over another nominee for the same film, William Holden. Beatrice Strait won Best Supporting Actress for only 5 minutes and 2 seconds of screen time, the shortest performance to win an Oscar. And Ned Beatty was nominated for the Best Supporting Actor Oscar for pretty much one scene. The previous year, Sidney Lumet had directed Dog Day Afternoon, which itself contained some of the greatest performances captured on film. So what was Lumet doing to elicit such brilliant motion picture acting? This is Making Film. Ensemble casts were nothing new for Lumet, who had previously directed Murder on the Orient Express, The Group, and the iconic Twelve Angry Men and Lamette's reputation for strong character pieces was helpful when casting the film. We never got a turn down. Whoever we sent the script to said yes. Usually, somewhere down the line, you've got second, third, fourth choices, and then finally some compromised choices. Not on network. Everybody there was the first choice, and they knew it. Another reason for this was the reputation of the screenwriter, Patty Chayefsky. Chevsky was one of the most successful television writers in the 1950s, the quote, golden age of television. He was disillusioned with the direction television was going, and wrote the satire as a commentary on the medium that he had once been such an important part of. Chayefsky had previously won screenwriting Oscars for Marty and The Hospital, and after his win for Network, he became the only person in history to win three screenwriting Oscars without the help of a co-writer. Highly unorthodox, Chayefsky's contract stated that he, the writer, was given final cut of the film, a power usually reserved for the director. This was Chayefsky's film. The first thing Lamette did was to bring the cast and crew together for two weeks of rehearsals at the Hotel Diplomat in Times Square. Script supervisor Martha Pinson, who worked with Lamette on many of his later films, detailed Lamette's rehearsal process in an essay titled The Lamette Method. Once gathered together, Lamette would first make an address about the piece, then they would move on to a table reading and discussion. The rehearsal process began on a cold January 5, 1976. They had wanted to use the large ballroom at the Hotel Diplomat for the table read, but it was unheated and they had to use an adjacent room. Everyone was excited to witness the meeting of acting giants William Holden and Peter Finch, who many had grown up with. Holden and Finch had never worked together. After the table read, Lamette would show location photographs. They'd analyze each scene to quote, put the film on its feet. As I mentioned in a video on Dog Day Afternoon, Lamette sometimes used the rehearsals to have the cast improvise dialogue that they would write into the script. This was not the case with Network. Here, the screenplay was sacred. Every line had to be spoken exactly as it was written. Chayefsky attended the rehearsals to make sure everything was working toward his vision. After all, he had final cut. Lamette announced to the cast that he wanted them to keep their performances simple, and that they should display, quote, pure behavior, but of course not quite as naturalistic as Dog Day Afternoon. I don't know what to say about actors reacting perfectly, because it's so much a part of the norm of what they're doing, if they're working well. So many times on pictures, because they haven't rehearsed it, because they haven't worked it out cleanly and, and in advance, these things are mechanical and forced, but uh, not here. The actual rehearsals would begin after the assistant director taped the floor plan of each set onto the floor of the rehearsal space. Luckily, the heat to the ballroom was fixed, and so they spent the next few days in there blocking the action in each scene. Chayefsky explained the hierarchies of UBS and CCA to the cast, and they were ready to begin. Then they were off, rehearsing each scene of the film as if it were a play. The scenes were blocked within the confines of the taped off floor plans. All the props needed were at their disposal. Lamette said that they would even rehearse transition scenes of walking, and if there were a car chase, they would rehearse that too. During rehearsal, Dunaway was often found thumbing through her quote, heavily annotated copy of the script. Other actors were afraid of the amount of Lamette's preparation. 
Lamette said, When I have worked with actors who only worked in movies, they come in terrified of rehearsal. They say Sydney's going to kill the spontaneity. The truth is the exact opposite. Because they know what they're doing, because they know where they are in the character, because they feel safe with me and in the selections they've made, they are twice as free. On a location, if a plane goes by, fine. They'll incorporate it or ignore it. If a dog bites them, they'll incorporate it or ignore it. They're open to whatever the momentary situation is because they are much more secure. So if anything, it helps spontaneity. This makes sense. The actual location will be a different environment. And there will always be a number of variables that the production will have to figure out how to roll with. If the cast is thoroughly prepared, I'd imagine that they might feel comfortable enough with the character to make spontaneous decisions if needed, while still having a sense memory of what's important for them to include. But it's just so much better to have layered already some sense of the performance. You need the continual exposure to the same thing happening again and again to give you an inkling of, uh uh, there's something uh, interesting here. Pinson said that these run throughs would, quote, clear up uncertainty about the arc and pitch of an actor's role the tone of a performance, and the intensity needed for any given scene in relation to what comes before and after. Everybody, even the bit players, would be on the same page and understand how they fit into the whole of the film. Lamette brought in his notebook of, quote, hand-drawn diagrams of where he expected to place his cameras and how he expected each sequence to unfold. That said, even though everything was worked out beforehand, they were still able to remain flexible. If, on the day of shooting, he couldn't remember how he wanted to block a scene, he would say that it must have been bad. Lamette said, I can't remember going past four takes on anything we did in network. If I go more than four takes, it's usually because I staged it wrong. Or maybe there are some words that are wrong. Rehearsal is also a time in which the actors can develop faith in me, in my taste and in my knowledge. Once they have that, they are released. They are free. Lamette would have the final run through on the last day of rehearsal in which the director of photography would attend. In this case, Owen Roisman and they would work out the lighting around what the actors were doing. This way, they could even be prepared enough to send the crew out to rig lights on sets well before they were ready to shoot there. They would also diagram all the camera positions and lenses they would use for each shot. The point of all of this extensive preparation was that Lamette liked to go fast during production. If you can believe it, the iconic Mad as Hell speech was done on the first day of shooting. These were actually the shots done with the television camera that would appear on the screens. They did four takes, and in each take, Peter Finch performed the entire two and a half minute scene, except for take three, which, quote, halted at the one minute mark for an unspecified reason. Stick your head out of the window, open it, and stick your head out and keep yelling and yell, I'm as mad as hell, I'm not gonna take this anymore. Remember when Lamette said that everyone they sent the script to said yes? While technically true, this doesn't mean that Peter Finch was their first choice from the start. In the months leading up to the production, Chayefsky and producer Howard Gottfried were intensely searching for an actor that had what it took to play Howard Beale. They even had to halt the production at one point because they were having such trouble finding the right person. A talent manager named Barry Cross came across the script, and while not too impressed with the character of Howard Beale, he decided to pester Gottfried into auditioning his client, Peter Finch. When Finch realized he would have to audition for the role, he angrily hung up on Cross only to call back a few minutes later to apologize, saying, Sorry, darling. I forgot I was an actor. Finch was an Australian living in England, and Lamette and Chayefsky were worried about whether or not he could be convincing as an American newscaster. Finch had Lamette send him a copy of the New York Times, and he read it in front of a camera to show that he could portray a newscaster's cadence in an American accent. And one day, Peter Finch called, and he said, if we would be good enough, to send him a tape of Walter Cronkite or John Chancellor, any one of the evening anchors. He would send us back a tape in two weeks with a perfect accent. That's exactly what we did. The tape arrived and we hired him. The second day of shooting, January 20th, 1976, had Finch performing the bullshit speech. Well, I'll tell you what happened. I just ran out of bullshit. All right, cut him off. Leave him on. The next day, January 21st, Finch was performing the mad as hell scene again, but this time it was for the actual camera. This is perhaps the most important scene in the movie. Howard Beale needed to be so impassioned that he would make an incredible impact on the country and carry us through the rest of the film. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it. How do you feel? We're mad as hell, and we're not going to take this anymore. 
Much like Sonny's phone call in Dog Day Afternoon, Lamette loaded up two cameras with film so that they wouldn't need to take time reloading. They could start the next take immediately after finishing the first and maintain the momentum and exhaustion of the performance. The first take ended, Lamette remarked that it was marvelous and they immediately started take two. Finch got up to the congressman line. I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. And then collapsed in his chair saying that he couldn't go any further. What we're actually seeing in the film is the first half of take two and the second half of take one. I want you to get mad. I believe the two takes are stitched together by this shot of Faye Dunaway. Finch being unable to finish the second take of the speech was an ominous foreshadowing of his failing health. About eight to ten months later, well after the film had wrapped and the Academy Awards were approaching, Finch was sitting on a bench at the Beverly Hills Hotel and Lamette was coming down to meet him when he suffered a fatal heart attack and keeled over. He went on to win the Oscar for his performance, becoming the first and only person to posthumously win Best Actor. In 2009, Heath Ledger became the second actor to win an Oscar after death. Ledger's was for Best Supporting Actor. What's interesting is that every line spoken in the film was exactly as Chayefsky had written it, except for the most important line of the film. Finch managed to accidentally sneak an extra as into the line, which originally read, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. But you can hear Finch say, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! You can even hear the correct line shouted by the people on the fire escapes and out of the windows. I'm mad as hell, and I'm not take this anymore! They had to leave Finch's version in the film because they had only shot it one and a half times. Lamette said that the beauty in Chayefsky's scripts was that it made the actors toe the line of what is realistic and unrealistic. It's the subtle progression of madness that makes you accept the insanity of exploiting Howard Beale for ratings. It is because of this that Lamette said that perhaps the most important thing to consider when casting is the progression of change over a character's arc. He says that you should cast for the third act. Cast for who the character ends up becoming. When casting a character like Howard Beale, cast the madman. Chayefsky would sit as close as possible to the actors so he could evaluate their performances and so he could make sure every line was delivered verbatim. He liked to sit under the key light because it was the angle in which the actors were best lit. There was even a running joke that if anyone was looking for Chayefsky on set, the first place they should look is under the key light. Chayefsky said, my biggest contribution is in explaining my humor to the actors. He's saying that life is bullshit and it is, so what are you screaming about? One of Chayefsky's contributions was in the scene of Howard Beale arriving at the studio directly before his mad as hell speech. Lamette originally had the security guard look Beale up and down and make a face at the strangeness of a news anchor arriving at the station soaking wet in his pajamas. Chayefsky told Lamette, this is TV. He shouldn't even notice him. What do you do, Mr. Beale? I must make my witness. Sure thing, Mr. Beale. I had never quite realized how similar the humor in Network is to the humor in American Psycho. I like to dissect girls. Did you know I'm utterly insane? Uh, <laughs> uh, great tan, Marcus. The world seems indifferent to what we perceive as madness, and I think that's what gives the satire its weight. I think the trick is that we should believe that what is humorous to us is absolutely serious to the characters. For the role of Diana Christensen, they needed to find someone willing to do the part as Chayefsky envisioned the character. He would not allow any actor or actress to demand anything about their character be changed. Diana was a tricky part to cast because, as Lamette put it, Diana had to be played by someone who didn't need to be loved on screen. Lamette had heard that Faye Dunaway had a reputation for being difficult, so he visited her at her home to make sure that everything was out in the open. In his book Making Movies, Lamette writes, Crossing the floor of her apartment before I had even reached her, I said, I know the first thing you're going to ask me. Where's her vulnerability? Don't ask it. She has none. Faye looked shocked. Furthermore, if you try to sneak it in, I'll get rid of it in the cutting room. So it'll be a wasted effort. She paused just a second, then burst out laughing. She said yes. She never tried to get sentimental in the part, and she took home an Academy Award. My point is that it's so important to thrash these things out in advance. If push comes to shove, you can then say the obvious truth. This is a script we both said yes to, so let's do it. It was something that I could not do because I thought if I can infuse the performance with some sense of what she's paying, 
for this life, of what kind of poignancy. And I think I did. I think there was something there that you felt, you couldn't put your finger on it maybe, but, but you felt for this character. It's probably in the writing. On being considered difficult, Dunaway said, the fact is that a man can be difficult and people applaud him for trying to do a superior job. It is in my nature to do really good jobs. And I never would have been successful if I hadn't. Diana is such an interesting character because she is both the hero and the villain of the story. We follow her work and the conflict that arises when she meets obstacles. But because she tramples over these obstacles so fiercely and easily, we begin to notice how she is ruining real human beings on her way there. Lumet noted that each of the characters becomes corrupted by the end of the film, except for Diana, who he says was the way she was since the day she was born. For God's sakes, Diana, we're talking about putting a manifestly irresponsible man on national television. That said, one of the most brilliant things about the character is that they don't explain why she is the way she is. It makes things more complex to leave it unknown because the audience lacks the comfort of being able to explain her personality as a result of something specific. For the role of Max Schumacher, William Holden's name came up during a brainstorming session and everyone approved, and that was that. Holden had done around 70 movies before Network, yet Lament noted that he was actually pretty shy about acting. He had no theater background, so the theater-style rehearsal process was much different than what he was used to. Holden remarked after the rehearsal period that he finally felt like a real actor. The difference in training or difference in acting styles never matters if both actors are working honestly, which they both were. In his book, Lumet points out the importance of what the actor is seeing. He explains the standard practice of clearing the actor's eyeline to make sure that the actor sees only what the character sees. You can't have Holden bare his soul to Dunaway with, quote, some teamster sipping coffee behind her. I think we're all aware what happened when the director of photography didn't clear Christian Bale's eyeline during a scene in Terminator's Salvation. All right, I'm trying to f do a scene here and I'm going, why the f is Shane walking in there? What is he doing there? Do you understand my mind is not in the scene if you're doing that? Removing these distractions also helps an actor pretend that they are not being filmed at all, that the scene is actually unfolding. This way, Holden can play the scene as if Dunaway is the only thing he sees. But while rehearsing one of the most powerful scenes in the film, the primal doubt scene, Lamette noticed that Holden was looking everywhere but Dunaway's eyes. Lamette said, he looked at her eyebrows, her hair, her lips, but not her eyes. Lamette made a note of it, but didn't say anything. There's a good reason why he didn't try to correct this, even though the rehearsals were supposed to be the place to fix any issues that arise in the performances. Lamette said, on the day of shooting, we did a take. After the take, I said, Let's go again. And Bill, on this take, would you try something for me? Lock into her eyes and never break away from them. He did. Emotion came pouring out of him. It's one of his best scenes in the movie. Whatever he had been avoiding could no longer be denied. The rehearsal period had helped me recognize the emotional reticence in him. Lamette gave Dunaway the same direction, but for her, Lamette wanted Dunaway to quote, just try to understand what he's talking about. And when Holden says, I just want you to love me, primal doubts and all. You understand that, don't you? We get her only vulnerable moment in the film. I don't know how to do that. Lamette said, that's as close a moment as she gets. Dunaway described how she played the line as the character's quote, quintessential expression. Dunaway said, Diana isn't connected as a woman doesn't feel like a woman. With just those few seconds on the screen, you knew that she was completely unable to love. By the way, this scene was built entirely out of one take. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for part two, where I will discuss Robert Duvall, Beatrice Strait, Ned Beatty, and Arthur Burkhart, who played the great Ahmed Khan. Network was voted for by my patrons over on Patreon. If you would like to be a part of the vote coming up next month, head on over to Patreon now, pledge a dollar or more, and you'll be able to suggest three movies for the next vote. And if you're new here, please hit that subscribe button now because there are plenty more videos on the way for cinephiles like you. Thanks again for watching.